Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Norway Chess 2023. This is a super tournament with a very unique format where every player goes head to head and they compete for three points per game. If the game ends in a draw, they go to an Armageddon format and they compete for a little bit less. By the way, we're back on the main setup, uh, no longer on the uh, hostage setup. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed the recap. Today's recap features a handful of things. It features a fantastic game by Hikaru. It features a game by Magnus Carlsen that was deemed 2350 ELO according to chess.com game review and two other absolutely sensational games. I'm going to show you some games. I will show you the standings. Uh, welcome back to Gotham Chess Recaps. Welcome back to the studio setup. Uh, the very first game that I have for you is none other than Ali Reza Firuja versus Shakriar Mamidyarov. And this one, we are going to get started with a banger. We are going to have bangers in the middle. And we will bang until the very end. This entire video is going to be a banger. The game begins with pawn to d4. We have d5. Let me return on peace sounds. Uh, c4 and now pawn takes c4. This is called the Queen's Gambit accepted. And... Generally not a good opening for intermediate players because you're surrendering too much control of the center, but Shakhri Armamidyarov is hardly an intermediate player, and he responds with the most principled response, which is giving up a pawn back in the center. Now, it looks like this is a free pawn, but taking is not very good. <clears throat> White loses the right to castle, and White's pawns in the center are actually <clears throat> bigger liabilities than they are assets. Knight to f3 is played instead. Bishop b4 check is a line, knight c3, and now knight f6. You'll notice that the staring contest continues because nobody really wants to help the other person develop. Knight takes e5, and now Mamidyarov plays the move b5. Mamidyarov has given up the pawn in the center, but he has safely secured the pawns over here. Meanwhile, Firuja is building up a very, very powerful diagonal on this side. Castles, a3, the bishop slides backwards. Ali Reza tries to attack the integrity of that structure, and black plays a6. You will notice... Both sides have played nine moves. Both sides have not thought whatsoever because they know what they're doing. They know that all the moves that they have played have either been played before by players or computers and they have worked this out in some capacity. Uh, Ali Reza now plays the move bishop to e2. That was played after six minutes of thought, which means he is now no longer in his preparation. Mamid Yarov spends 13 minutes, which means that he probably got locked in the bathroom for 12 and a half and then made it back to the board. No, uh, both players are now comfortably thinking on their own. Bishop e2, I don't have to explain to you. Uh, this move I might. Uh, Black does not develop anything on the queen side and instead tries to remove the knight from e5 and also wants to play c5 in the future and is trying to maintain the c6 square for that knight. Uh, now Ali Reza doesn't castle and plays bishop e3, his intention is to do something like this where his bishops will laser beam the queen side and make it quite difficult for... Uh, make it quite difficult for... Uh, for, for, for Mamidyarov to move. Um, you know, I just, I noticed, I, I don't, it, because of this new setup, uh, I don't know if I'm kind of looking in the same direction that I always have been. I feel like generally I'm kind of looking, I don't know. Anyway, I'll play around with it. If I'm looking in the wrong direction, please let me know. <laughs> I feel like normally I'm looking this way, unless I'm going crazy. I have to rewatch some of my videos. This is very funny. Let me know in the comments if I'm looking in the wrong direction. <laughs> then I'll put the board on this side. That's very, very humorous. Um, we have uh, c6, though. We don't have the move knight takes c5 played. We have c6, knight takes, knight takes, and still all of these possibilities uh, exist in the position. Castles, bishop b7, and now queen e1. The center is very big. The queen is rotating over to this side of the board with some attacking possibilities. And Mamidyarov plays the move f5. The position, is, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's already complete insanity on the board. Black can play b4, black can take, black can take this, black can move the queen in any of these directions. Black can move the queen there, black can put the bishop here, black can put the rooks on any of those squares. So many possibilities, which is why Ali Reza thinks for eight minutes and decides to capture, uh, inducing the rook to come forward and plays bishop d1 with the intention to play bishop c2 and go over here. Mamidyarov preemptively moves back with the rook. Queen goes to g3, lining up not just on this diagonal, but also on the straightaway to the black king. We have knight f6, knight d5, queen b6, and the pressure is mounting on the white position. Mamidyarov has done a very nice job despite being down 20 minutes on the clock. And uh, now we have queen h4, bishop d2, and as you can see, uh, the computer is actually heavily, heavily preferring White's position, it, uh, Black's position at things after something like b4. 
Uh, black has very, very, very strong pawns, and the position for white is very difficult. But Mamidyarov chooses not to do that. Bishop g6, and now bishop back to b1, and, and, and after this, uh, Ali Reza doesn't take. And again, b4 is coming at some moment. Mamidyarov decides to capture like this. Knight goes to f4, pressure on e2, pressure on g2, rook g6 possibilities in the future. c5 is coming, by the way, at a moment's notice. And uh, the white position is under heavy existential threat. Computer, of course, doesn't prefer c5. The computer preferred the black plays queen d8, which I can't really explain to you, but I think it's g5. Um, yeah, but the computer wanted that. Mami Jarev plays the human move and bulldozes his way into g2. And at this point, Ferruja's position is looking quite dire. Okay, we have d takes c5, queen to c6, bishop d4, and uh, things are just not looking very good if you're Ferruja. But all of a sudden, but all of a sudden, but all of... Wait a minute, who's actually losing here? Because if you go back a few moves, Mamizyarov looked like... You know, every one of his pieces was about to participate in the absolute bludgeoning of the white position. And within a few moves, I think he drastically underestimated the resilience of Ferruja's position. And all of a sudden, uh, Ferruja's winning all of Mamidyarov's pieces. Like, the knight is hanging, the queen is hanging, and the bishop. And now the, ro the, bishop is, uh, the rook is hanging over there. And now this rook sacrifices itself. And Ferruja just takes the other rook. I mean, Ferruja got... Ferruja doesn't care. Rook e3, rook d1, rook f3, and Ferruja just escapes. Rook f1 check. Looks like it's checkmate. But rook f1 back is check, which is why after 40 moves, black resigned, as after king g2, it's game over for black. Just something like rook g2 or queen c7. Mamidyarov could have played on, I think, but uh, he either lost on time in this position or he decided that he had had enough. And uh, he just resigns and uh, Ferruja wins. A very complicated back and forth game, but you haven't seen nothing yet. I'm about to serve you... This is one of the most insane games of chess I've ever seen. And then we still haven't even looked at Hikaru's game and we still haven't looked at Magnus Carlsen getting called... Uh... You know, getting called a low elo player uh, by uh, by Chess.com's game review. And for some reason, it doesn't even have timestamps. So that's great. I think maybe the timestamps never carried over from the Armageddon game. But it's okay. We will take a look if necessary. E4 by Tari. This one is a Rosalimo Sicilian. D6. Castles, Bishop D7. And it was in this position that Tari went back to F1 after just playing rook e1. It's a very close position. So what does Tari want? He wants to play c3 and d4, and he wants to be in good shape. Which is why in this position, uh, it was extremely, extremely wild that... Nodjerbek Abdusatorov played rook g8. Huh? Rook g8 with the intention of playing g... Okay, well, at least he got Tari to commit his d-pawn. But folks, it got, real, it, got, it got real crazy real fast because in this position, my man Ari and Tari played b4, which is a move that is protected two different times. But the point is that you are sacrificing a pawn in order to win time on this side of the board and not just time. The idea is to win development bishop takes or knight takes are good you can even not take with anything you could go d4 e5 and basically just completely ignore the pawn in a3 nodes your back does not take the pawn he tries to sacrifice the pawn which is why tari plays c4 and tries to win the pawn back with his queen while maintaining a clamp on the center both guys in prep g5 queen b3 g4 pawn takes knight takes now judging from tari just spending 30 minutes on the move d4 uh, you would think that he expected something else. And he did go to the confessional booth. They have this really cool thing at Norway Chess where the players can talk to a camera in between rounds uh, and confess things like, you know, uh, this is my prep or I, I don't really like my position or I shower with my socks on or whatever grandmasters confess to. I think Tari was only anticipating bishop takes g4. Knight takes g4, now d4. And basically, this is Tari's game plan. Tari's game plan is me push, me push, me take, me take, me take, me take, me get king. Queen a5. 
Queen a5 has eyes on the rook and also wants to play queen h5 with various pressure on the h2 square. Tari just developed knight c3. You will notice that Ari and Tari spent 50 minutes on, the neck, on, on these two moves. That's not going to work in the long run, but for now it does. Bishop g7 and Arian strikes forward with e5. Uh, computer absolutely gushing over Tari's position. Really, really likes it, thinks it's really good. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's quite convinced by the position. D takes. And now Tari plays bishop d2, which is something we call a little zwitschenzook. He wants to play knight d5 on the next move. And after knight d5 and forcing the queen all the way back, he wants to continue the, you know, queen b7, all this good stuff. Bishop b4, I gotta get a new mouse. Queen d8 is played by Neuserbeck and d5. And I mean, my man Aryan is just like galloping forward. His position looks absolutely sensational, I gotta tell you. This... This is really looking bad for Nojirbek, whose king is in the center of the board. He now has to move his bishop there to arbitrarily block this. But now we just have f4. So the bishop is going to get sent packing anyway. Bishop h8, bro. Like, unironically, bishop e5 inducing f4. This man just put his bishop in the corner and his rook. Like, this looks like Fisher random. I don't know what we're playing. Meanwhile, Tari plays c5. Tari just confidently marching forward. Now king f8 sidestepping off the e-file. This is ridiculous. What are we even analyzing here? This doesn't even look like a real position. I mean, this looks like an insult. Aryan plays rook c1. And rook c1 is not a good move. I mean, I don't understand something about chess. You've moved every piece. What are you supposed to do? Apparently, you're supposed to play rook a, b1. That is what the computer wanted. Well, here's what the thing is about this position. It's actually shockingly difficult to make forward progress. So he goes here. d3 now which can be taken two different ways, but the bishop is trying to go to d4, and if you take it with the queen, now bishop b5 comes in. So bishop c3, and Tari just goes c6. I mean, he's all in. Apparently, e6 was an inaccuracy. Take, take, queen h4 looks mildly unpleasant, and uh, Tari's winning. Tari is completely winning here with a sensational defensive measure. In this position, black is threatening maiden one. One of the ways to escape maiden one is to take this pawn and run the king. But there is a completely winning sequence in this position that uses offense to play defense. In the words of ESPN commentator Mark Jackson, good defense, better offense. Mama, there goes that man. And among other things. What happened to the game I love? Well, in this position, white can play check to the black king. Check to the black king. And g3. And mate is covered by the queen. It's ridiculous. Check, check, g3. However, that does not happen. And instead of that, Ariantari goes here and takes. Here's the problem. Now his king is going to get hunted. Now his king's going for a little walk. A little walk, all right? E takes d5. Queen e5. He comes into d7. But Nodjerbek meets him right there, and a move later, Nodjerbek is going to get that knight back. And now, folks, we are in an endgame. And when the dust has settled, it's black who is up material. Knight e5, and he's two pawns up. Nodjerbek played one of the most ridiculous defensive games I have ever seen. I've never seen something like this. This dude has king f8, rook g8, bishop h8. When he plays like that, he's a defensive specialist. When I play like that, I'm an idiot, right? When I play king f8, rook g8, bishop h8, I'm stupid. When he does it, he's a defensive savant. Queen h4, Aryan misses a ridiculous geometric resource, and all of a sudden, everything's said and done, he's down two pawns in an endgame. This is heartbreaking because Aryan played a really, really fascinating opening idea, and then it just didn't work. It just didn't work. So, that's how it goes sometimes. Dust settles. Nodjerbek is up two pawns. And he very confidently, very methodically, brings the rooks down to the first rank. And Tari's got nothing here, as his king is boxed in. Mate is coming on h2. And that's the end of the game. It do be that way sometimes. Sometimes there's nothing you can do. Meanwhile, Hikaru was, Hikaru was putting in work. Hikaru was playing against Gukesh. He played a Taraj defense, which I've never... I mean, I'm sure he's played it, but he hasn't played it recently. And we had a totally symmetrical position from Gukesh. We played the move A3. 
There's a little bit of pawn capturing. Bishop sliding back to uh, d3. And the position became an isolated pawn position early. Where a move like knight takes d4 does not work because... A little tactical skirmish, discover check, and uh, rook on d4 would be hanging. So that doesn't work out. All right. Um, so e takes d4, bishop to e7. And in this position, white is going to be happy if white is able to utilize the pawn as a shield and play around it, creating problems for black. Black is going to be happy blockading the pawn, trading down the pieces, and winning an endgame. All right, white likes dynamics. So white trades the knights, puts pressure, the bishop is going to come out, and the rook is going to put some pressure here, and maybe d5. Hikaru, in the meantime, is going to look for exchanges. He's going to look to trade the bishops, okay? He's going to look to trade the queens, just very arbitrarily, all right? Something like this. Look at how much this trade benefits black. Knight goes to b3, rooks come down. White is losing a massive chunk of advantage by trading pieces. So, Hikaru plays knight a5, rook c1, and queen back to b8. Bishop d5, and queen b7. He's created a blockade around the isolated pawn. Right, very sophisticated stuff here. Now, obviously, there's more to it than that. There are more in-depth uh, continuations. There's, you know, lines that you've got to calculate. It's, 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 it's not that straightforward. Bishop d3 played, and in this position, Hikaru played one of the most controversial moves I have ever seen. Uh, and I don't say that lightly. Hikaru here could have played knight b3 and forked the rooks, and we would have had a very crazy forcing sequence, like bishop h7 and queen h5 and rook d4. But instead of that, Hikaru played the move f5. I feel like the move f5 would have made some grandmasters of the past gag because that move is a very 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 aggressive pawn thrust that completely sabotages the dark squares like white will now live on the dark squares forever but for that you completely negate this attack you also create a very powerful light squared stronghold and you never have to worry about being mated and now you can begin operating on the other side of the board F5 is potentially a disastrous anti-positional move, but it could potentially be a brilliant dynamic move. So we have knight F3 and rook E1. All right, and Hikaru's doing what he's supposed to do. He's rerouting, he's putting pressure on the isolated pawn. Queen E5 and rook C8. And so far, Hikaru's game plan has worked. Gukesh's has not so much. One rook trade down. The maneuvering continues. All right, queen D7. Now here comes Gukesh. It's very clear what Gukesh wants. All right, very clear. He's trying to checkmate. Hikaru, in the meanwhile, trading pieces. He knows that the end games benefit him, not just because of the pawn, because now of the bishop pair. All right, queen e5. It's still very clear what Gukesh would like to achieve. Hikaru is just trying to trade the pieces down. Like, Hikaru has a very methodical approach. Use potentially anti positional measures to suppress the play of white, trade pieces down. Pawns are going to be a weakness in the end game. Gukesh says no trade. Hikaru says, okay, a5. Now, that pawn is a permanent target, that pawn is a target, and that pawn is a target. Gukesh says, all right, this should be five. And a few moves later, knight f4. But Hikaru picks up a pawn. Queen d2, bishop e5. And Hikaru is in good shape. He's in cruise control here, right? The pressure is being applied. There's a squeeze happening. Bishop d4. But in this position, the computer gives an utterly ridiculous defensive countermeasure, which would have been Bishop F1! A backwards bishop move that would have pinned the bishop to the rook, and if you take, there would have been rook d8 and checkmate to follow. But Gukesh misses it. Bishop e2 played, queen e4, and it's just a matter of time as Hikaru is up a pawn in an endgame, but it's more than a pawn. It's more than a pawn. It's the entirety of the queen side, basically, as Hikaru is going to get down there, put pressure, and the majority of pawns is going to prove decisive. He advances. And in this position, Gukesh resigned as uh, he cannot sustain anymore. He cannot sustain. G4 is hanging. The queen side is always falling. White's position is stretched too thin to sufficiently defend everything. So after G4, bishop e6, 
Lukash resigned, and Hikaru won a very, very, very nice game with Black. A very nice game with Black. Um, there was one weird computer hiccup, but overall, this was a fantastic game. And really, the question is, is F5 a work of art, madness, genius, everything? I mean, is it deviance? F5 is a ridiculous anti-positional move. It's, it's definitely an option. But, like I said, I feel like Soviet Grandmasters, if you told them to move F5, they would projectile vomit all over you. And they wouldn't even clean it. So, uh, fantastic stuff. Now, Magnus uh, drew his game in Classical. So they had to go to an Armageddon, he and Wesley. Um, the time was not a massive factor, so we're going to look at this game. And, okay, I guess chess.com did not copy over the timestamps. Uh, if you give me, like, 30 seconds, I'm, I'm, I'm going to see maybe... Uh, Maybe I can pull up the timestamps, but if I, uh, if, if I pull them up, then there's a chance that there's not going to be... Uh... All right, well, you know what? We'll have timestamps, but we won't have... Uh... We won't have... The players won't have, like, images and stuff. I'll get you timestamps. There's the timestamps. I do apologize. For... I don't know how that happened, but... Sometimes when you watch a game and you haven't refreshed, the timestamps don't load. Anyway, Magnus has white. E4, E5. We have a Berlin, no Berlin, and remember, black has three minutes less, but black starts with three minutes less because if black makes a draw, black wins. Bishop C5. And from an early standpoint, uh, Magnus was playing quickly, confidently, and aggressively. Knight BD2, Wesley started pushing him backwards, and actually Wesley got the upper hand from the opening. The computer really liked his position, but... Magnus is maintaining a two and a half minute time advantage, which is really no joke. Wesley plays pawn takes d4, c takes d4, and clearly it is Wesley right now who is calling the shots. I mean, he is, I mean, it looks like Magnus is playing with his shoe size together, which I gotta tell you, I don't think it's the biggest deal in the world for a chess player to tie their shoes together because you play chess seated and chess players don't move around a whole lot. Queen a4. Bishop takes f3. Knight takes f3. Magnus has sacrificed the rook. Bishop takes e1, and he's done it to get into a7. Magnus just sacrificed the rook to get a pawn. Now, the bishop doesn't have... Just so we're clear, the bishop doesn't have enough time to run away. Because knight e5 and mate, so black would have to sack the queen. So queen a7, queen b4, rook e1. But knight takes g3, h takes g3. I mean, Magnus is just down in exchange. But what does Magnus have? He's up two minutes. He's up two minutes on the clock. That goes a long way. All right, um, queen back to b6. Of course, uh, Wesley knows that this endgame is not something that Magnus is interested in. He doesn't have enough artillery, so he plays queen b6. Um, but in this position, apparently, Wesley could have just ran. If check, king e7. That's it. That's the whole attack. And then if you try to defend yourself on d1, I'll trap your queen. You can go here, and you can check me, but I'm going to run to g7. So... Yeah, uh, Wesley plays queen b6. Magnus, of course, gives a check and runs away. No queen trade. f6, and Magnus just keeps going. d5. Just d5. Again, maintaining a two and a half minute time advantage, which is almost the full allotted time of the Armageddon bonus. King c8 back. Now pawn to e5. All right, and, and here comes downhill Magnus. Not even, you know, no hesitation whatsoever. Two and a half minutes up. It's Armageddon. You got to win with white. Wesley plays king to b8. Pressure, you know, heartbeat elevating. Pawn takes f6. Pass pawn and also knight e5, knight f7 opportunities. Wesley plays c takes d5, which is the best move. And now f7, hello, hello. I'm not just attacking you on the queen side. I'm also knocking on the door and my pawn is an anchor for my rook that's going to go to e8 and threaten promotion. Queen f6, that's great. Knight e5, I'm defending my pawn. I have knight d7 ideas. This is very unpleasant for black, who is now down a whopping nearly three minutes on the clock. The entire amount of time that you are given for a time advantage for white in the Armageddon. Rookie three, uh-oh. Uh-oh, it's checkmate coming. What is Wesley going to do? Is he going to panic? Is he going to play c5? c5, rook a3, there's no checkmate. The king is going to c7. You can give me a check all you want. I'm running away. So c5 is the move, but Wesley decides I'm going to sacrifice my rook back. Magnus, uninterested. Uninterested in collecting the knight, uh, the rook for the knight. c6, Magnus says queen a7, king c7, rook b3. Hello, hello. You can play defense. Watch this. I'm zipping right back. Rook f3. Now if you take rook f7, king d8, I am not interested in this. I am interested in this. And black is going to lose the rook. 
You see, in this position, if Black played any other move, he would have lost the Rook. So Magnus utilized two infiltration spots, A8 and E8, to cause head-spinning complications here. And this looks like it was a very clean game of chess. The computer hated it, though. The computer thought... <laughs> Stockfish after this game thought Magnus was 2350 and Black was 2000. Which just goes to show you that Armageddon causes these players to play at a level below their actual ability. Which is not really fair to them, but that's just unfortunately how it goes. Um, so, let's check the standings, shall we? Standings uh, after day two, after round two of uh, Norway Chess. Here they are. This is, uh, this is not a very pretty uh, website, but there you go. And um, it's currently... I th hold on a minute. I, I, I think th this one is cleaner. It, no, both bad. All right, I got to crop it. Anyway, um, maybe this one? Maybe this one. Nope, all bad. All right. Fabiano Caruana in first place with... Uh, with four and a half. Fabi winning in uh, Armageddon and also winning in Classical. Nodirbeck has four. This doesn't really matter. We're only two rounds out of nine into it, but these are your standings. Aryan, Shahriar, Magnus, Wesley. These are players that have scored points in an Armageddon. Hikaru's doing quite well. He has four, one win in, the, in uh, Classical and a loss in uh, Armageddon, so four points. Anyway, if you're confused about any of this, NorwayChess.com. Uh, or dot no, dot no. See you in the next video. Get out of here.